Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? I'm always terrible with microphones. OK, excellent. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess I'm going to start tonight by talking about um, a moment many years ago where I had to make uh, one of the most important decisions of my life. It was June 20th of 1998. Uh, around that time, me and a group of organizers in Portland, Oregon, known as Liberation Collective, uh, we'd begun um, gathering trade industry publications from the vivisection industry. And we had noticed that in a small town called Philomath, there was a breeder of Florida white rabbits for the vivisection industry. This was sort of before the popular use of the internet. And so all they had listed for contact was a P.O. box. Uh, we began to monitor uh, the post office where the P.O. box was located. And finally, after weeks of sitting there and working in shifts, uh, we finally saw someone go in and remove mail from the box. And then they were followed back to the breeding farm. And so we began to organize a, a demonstration. We called for activists all along the west coast of the United States uh, to come out to this regional action where we'd be protesting the farm. And I really thought that it was going to go the way that most of our demonstrations did at the time, that we would show up and that we would be outnumbered by the police and that the police would be in a, filed, um, a single file line all along the fence of the farm and that we would stand there with our signs and try to talk to the neighbors. Um, but instead, as we arrived, there were no police there at all. And the owner of the farm didn't seem to be present. I remember I was standing on this gravel road, looking down a driveway at sheds containing tens of thousands of rabbits. And I had this thought, what does it say about me if I don't jump this fence? Knowing that these animals are slated to die in a laboratory in some of the worst ways imaginable, knowing what they would give in order to escape that fate, what does it say about me personally if I don't take the risk to at least go down and attempt to get a few of them out? I didn't want to put other activists at risk. And so I announced to everyone my intentions. And I said, I understand if people want to leave. Um, but nobody did. And in fact, dozens of people joined me in jumping that fence. We ran down to those sheds, and we opened cages, and we removed dozens and dozens of rabbits, and we ran back up to the street, and we got them into cars, and people drove off. And there was this feeling inside of me uh, where all of a sudden, all the things that the animal rights movement does to turn animals into abstractions, where we talk about them merely as statistics, as numbers, as billions of lives, or as a single species, melted away. And suddenly here I was, holding an individual against my chest and feeling their beating heart, and knowing that the only thing that was between them and death was myself. It was an epiphany. And it was also an amazing action, because despite the fact that I was very open about uh, breaking the law, and that I wasn't masked up, when the police began making their rounds and asking <laughs> who had organized this and who had taken the rabbits and so on, nobody told on anybody. Uh, there was this tremendous solidarity. And um, I don't know, it sort, of, uh, it sort of propelled my life forward, that decision that day. Uh, I wish I could say that that decision ended uh, entirely in, in positive effects for me. Uh, of course, eventually, um, that decision and uh, similar decisions like it landed me in, in federal prison for three years. Um, in the days after uh, June 20th of 1998, um, we were trying to rehome the rabbits, and people were inspired by the action. Uh, lots of people had been aware that we were going to be there that day, and of course, were paying attention to, to what was occurring. It went out over the internet. People were calling each other about it. And um, it felt as if, uh, frighteningly enough, everyone was somewhat aware um, that I had been involved. I was young at the time. Um, I was only about 22 or 23 years old and arrogant 
and enculturated into the uh, sort of typical North American masculinity, the sudden attention on me was horribly negative, uh, and especially because the militant animal rights culture at that time um, was so cartoonish and so hyper-masculine and ridiculously militant. Oh my God, by the way, any of you who ate that chili sauce earlier, I don't know if you're sweating like I am, <laughs> don't, don't eat too much of the chili sauce. Just a warning to everyone present. <laughs> Um, anyhow, the soft side of me, the kind part of my heart that I believe had led me to jump that fence, somehow began to give way to this part of me that rather enjoyed the attention and that enjoyed the fact that people knew that I had done this. I went from, you know, wearing jeans and regular t-shirts to being the guy at the demo who for some reason is dressed very paramilitary. I don't know why you need combat pants to hold a sign, but I felt very much that I did. I had all the accoutrement, of course, the circle ALF shirts and, and you know, that's great, it's fine. Uh, but eventually for me, this militant animal rights thing, it began to give way to that abstraction that I talked about earlier. I was part of an animal rights movement and somewhere abstractly I knew that I wanted to liberate animals. But animals as individual lives who were in immediate need of aid, something about that sort of drifted away. There have been a lot of criticisms of, um, of direct action within the animal rights movement in the last few years. And I'm sorry to say that most of those criticisms are deserved by the movement. Early on, as, as um, the Animal Liberation Front and similar groups began to form, there was something that they were doing that was very positive. Um, much like nowadays how we see uh, undercover investigations reaching the public, when people first began to go into labs and slaughterhouses, when they began to go into breeding facilities and, and other places of animal abuse, oftentimes the footage that was produced was, was the first time the public had gotten a glimpse inside of these places. It was electrifying to people too who had worked for many years, you know, sometimes dozens of years uh, on projects that weren't going anywhere to suddenly discover that overnight the animals that they were seeking to assist could be removed from these, these laboratories. Groups like the Northern Animal Liberation League and other, uh, other leagues began to see what was being done by the Animal Liberation Front and other groups as somewhat individualistic. And so they had the idea of socializing uh, direct action, making it something that could be popular and supportable by a wide mass of the public. They began to conduct raids where thousands of people would join them in storming laboratories. Um, in some famous cases, they were able to enter laboratory grounds with upwards of 5,000 people. This was receiving positive media coverage across, across the United Kingdom, and it was inspiring other activists around the world. But eventually, things devolved into what I would now call a cult of militancy, an echo chamber where the most extreme actions were applauded, where criticism was not welcome, uh, and where sort of cult cult uh, sorry, cartoonish cult-like figures uh, gained sway in the movement and became the loudest voices. Sorry, one moment. Damn chili sauce. <laughs> it was hot. <laughs> Pardon me, thank you. <laughs> Little embarrassing to travel uh, from Seattle, Washington and have to mop your forehead in front of everyone. <laughs> Anyhow, as I mentioned, much of the criticism of direct action these days is warranted. When people talk about the rhetoric behind direct action and how almost, um, I don't know, G.I. Joe it has become, um, the rah-rah cheerleading nonsense. When people talk about how the aesthetic behind direct action eventually fell from being about non-human animals to masked angry young men in balaclavas, all of these things are true. However, 
This is not an argument against direct action itself. We can decouple direct action from these elements. And so today, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some ideas of how that might occur. Those of you who, uh, who follow other struggles, and I hope that, that many of you do, will be aware that um, throughout history, people have had to break laws in order to further social justice. Um, in the realm of animal rights, uh, laws are a particularly troubling thing because only one species creates them, and typically just for the benefit of that species. To say that to never break the law, um, and, and there are, I mean, in the United States, there are animal rights organizations that say we should never, as a matter of course, uh, break the law, seems entirely speciesist to me. These laws were not designed for non-humans. They were designed by humans uh, who, you know, we come from this background of, of speciesism. Um, these other social justice movements that I have mentioned, um, another thing that it, it seems that they have realized was that the face of these movements should be representative of those movements. Although white people, for example, helped with the civil rights movement and joined in with the black power movement in, in the United States, for example, it makes sense that a white person should not be the face of the civil rights movement. Um, although men participated in the rise of the feminist movement, it makes perfect sense that men should not be the face of the feminist movement. So as we begin to examine how we might head towards a more popular militancy for animals, uh, a militancy in which many, many, many people can begin to see themselves participating in direct action for animals, participating in the direct intervention of, uh, of, re sorry, of removing animals from places of, of abuse, I'm curious why the face of the movement is always a person in a mask. I look back at some of the best liberations that have ever occurred in the world, uh, and I, I'm talking about the ones where the public was sympathetic, where they saw the horror that was occurring, and where they agreed something had to be done, where they agreed that it made sense that people should enter these places and remove the animals therein. Uh, and I think often back to the raid on UC Riverside in California, I think about the monkey bridges, and how he became the face of that raid, and how more so than any human figure there, um, it was bridges that the public was seeing. One of the things that I would like to see as, as we begin to move forward and decouple uh, 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 direct action uh, from its hyper-masculinity and from its ugly rhetoric and from its silly aesthetics is that we begin to place more often front and center uh, the animals. Um, right now, we're in a situation where typically uh, an animal liberation front communique, and I'm sorry, even the term communique is ridiculous and militaristic and uh, is part of that rhetoric that doesn't really advance uh, in any way a movement for animals. But typically these statements will have these like really grandiose things like the hammer of vegan justice falls. And uh, it's like we're Cobra from a, the cartoon, you know? Um, what I would like to see is for these things to start to become softer and less about the human emotions involved, more about the actual condition that those animals are in, the conditions that they're now moving to and about the rationale for coming in and removing them. Uh, another thing I, I would like to see is we're talking about, uh, as we're talking about the aesthetic of, uh, of militant direct action, um, is I would like to start seeing something that comes more from a place of kindness. Um, currently, when I go onto animal rights websites that uh, supposedly support uh, direct action, it's not uncommon for me to see nothing but crossed M16s, uh, images of people throwing uh, Molotovs, um, essentially nothing but destruction, balaclavas, things that the public associates with terrorism. 
wouldn't it be wonderful if instead people saw that softer side of our hearts, the part that has encouraged so many people in this room um, to come forward and to give up so much of their time, to make sacrifices and to begin to work on these issues to remove animals from these places of abuse. I don't think that most of us, when we got involved, this is horribly embarrassing. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I got off track there. Um, however, I was, uh, as I was saying, I believe that what motivates most of us in this room and what will continue to motivate most people to get involved is not the opportunity to look tough, not the opportunity to, um, to basically impress their friends with you know, how paramilitary they look. Uh, so I would like to see that changed and for our rhetoric to begin to talk about those softer feelings in our hearts that motivate us to take these actions. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so, um, I have gotten so off track with what I had intended to say. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit now, I guess, about uh, the Stop Huntington cru uh, Animal Cruelty Campaign uh, that, uh, that I was a part of for, for many, many years. Um, I know that many of you have seen uh, Jake Conroy uh, speak recently as he's toured throughout Europe. And uh, wow, what an amazing tour. First of all, just the media that he's been gaining lately has been so heartening to me because Jake is such a like, kind and compassionate person. I know every time that he uh, gets in a newspaper article or is on the radio or on television uh, that something intelligent is going to be said. Um, we both joined uh, the Shack movement right around the same time uh, with an organization called Shack Seattle, uh, where we began to go after a bank uh, by the name of Stevens Incorporated. They were Huntington Life Sciences, uh, um, the holder of their loan debt facility and their largest institutional investor. At that time, uh, as I go back, I look at the participation and the excitement that we had. We were a very inclusive organization. Um, we did not have a, a rhetoric that basically said, you're with us or you're against us. We did not talk down to people. We did not insist that only the most militant actions were the ones that had worth. And so our demonstrations began to grow and grow and grow. And it began to inspire people across the United States, not just what we were doing in Seattle, uh, but what was, happening, uh, what was happening elsewhere in the United States, and of course, over here in Europe and elsewhere in the world, 18 countries in total, in fact. Um, at that time, it was wonderful to be able to go to a demonstration and to see somebody there who was perhaps um, 60 years old and they were walking with a cane and they were dedicated to getting those animals out of that lab. And then there'd be a 17 year old, your classic punk rock kid, a little bit crusty, uh, a butt patch that you know has to say like ass rash or fleas and lice, uh, and they would be there. We'd have school kids there. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, there were uh, your straight edge kids and their Earth Crisis hoodies and their camouflage shorts. And, uh, but basically, there was this wonderful cross section. And at that time, when they came to the demonstrations, uh, it basically, um, it was a feeling that everyone uh, was there working on a common goal and that they, um, and that they were supported by everyone else there. Once again, I wish that I could say that that had continued to be the case. Um, unfortunately, as Shaq developed, it became much more militaristic. Um, over time, and, and once again, I, I want to accept my own responsibility for that, there began to become uh, this feeling that the only thing that mattered was, was how tough you were. The only thing that mattered was whether or not you were involved in direct action, whether or not you were involved in storming offices, whether or not you were involved in spray painting buildings, whether or not you were involved in uh, smashing windows. 
the feeling of support started to shrink away. Another thing that was happening quite commonly was at demonstrations. Um, people who had just come to participate, people who had maybe seen a flyer or they'd stopped by a stall and been asked, hey, come on out on this demo, they were being put at risk of arrest um, by, frankly, by people like myself uh, who, um, who had a little bit too much hypermasculinity going and who would engage in direct action at times where it became dangerous to others. Um, moving forward, this, of course, is something which we must also address if we are to get to a popular militancy. What do I mean by a popular militancy? I mean actions that can be supported, that almost anyone can engage in, things that don't require any specialization of skill, um, things that, uh, that, um, that it becomes difficult for our opponents to demonize us for doing. Um, I mean something that can get the strength of numbers to actually finally topple these industries that we all hate so very, very much. Every day, um, billions of animals die. Sorry, millions of animals die. And this is something that everyone in this room is aware of. It's very, very infrequent, though, that we ever ask ourselves, what is it going to take to end that? I don't believe that legalistic approaches are ever going to win. I think that actions like civil disobedience and voluntary arrest, open rescues and such, um, have their place. But there's always going to be a necessity for people to take anonymous action for people to act outside of the law and outside of the reach of the courts and the police, um, for people who are going to essentially take it directly to the animal abusers and go directly to the animals in their places of abuse and remove them. Um, I'm so sorry. I've gotten so off topic today. <laughs> um, I think at this point I'm just going to uh, hand it over for questions and answers. Does anyone have a, does anyone have a question? Right there. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, one question, do you think it would be of advantage if the animal rights movement would have, have sort of like a same leader um, as the previous social justice movements? Um, that or li um, li like that, that famous face you were talking about? You know, I, um, I'm, I'm always very skeptical of, uh, of uh, a leaders in the animal rights movement because once again it often seems like they are taking up the room that should be taken up by non-humans. I think that what we, we would uh, do better with than just a, a singular face is rather a variety of faces and quite frankly, less faces like my own. <laughs> um, the animal rights movement has been predominantly white, and in the public eye, it's been predominantly male, even though those of us working on campaigns understand that the vast majority of volunteers and organizations, the vast majority of organizers, and the vast majority of people taking care of business have always been women. Um, however, uh, due to the broad sexism of most of the cultures in which we've grown up, uh, it tends to be male faces that get the most attention. I would like to see that eventually shrink away. And so I'd say, to answer your question, I don't think that we would do well to actually have a singular leader or a singular spokesperson. I would like to see um, many, many voices coming forward, voices that can appeal uh, to the communities and demographics that they come from. Thank you. Do we have another question? Hi. Hello. Uh, what do you think about uh, direct action everywhere that's in the uh, in United States? Um, I receive this question uh, an awful lot nowadays. <laughs> um, how can I handle this diplomatically? Um, <laughs> for one thing, I, I feel that their name sort of confuses the term direct action. 
to me, direct action has always been uh, the direct intervention in the killing or harming of a, of a living being or some sabotage to prevent, that, the, to prevent the same. Um, and so to me, symbolic actions um, or actions where you're walking into a restaurant and confronting customers about their, their food choices, um, I'm not quite sure that that qualifies as direct action. Uh, dressing as a, a burrito and laying on the sidewalk in front of Chipotle uh, isn't quite the same as cutting into a cage and removing the animal inside. Um, that said, as I've mentioned, throughout the course of my own activism, I've made horrendous mistake after horrendous mistake. And it's only been because I've stayed involved for so long and been willing to be so self-critical that I've been able to sort of advance my politics and come to what I believe is a, a more reasonable philosophy on animal rights. The thing that I like very much about direct action everywhere, and it's difficult for me to admit that I like anything about them, um, but the thing that I like so very much about them is that they have managed to find some kind of popular mass. Um, they've struck a chord in a lot of people, including a lot of communities that we do not typically reach. My hope is that as these people continue to be involved, that their own philosophies will evolve and that eventually they'll come to a place where they recognize that confronting people in a dairy aisle uh, may not be the best path to animal liberation. All right, other questions? Yeah, we have another question here. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, you said uh, that you uh, think it's important to use um, strategies that make it hard for uh, uh, the animal abusing industries to uh, demonize um, animal liberators. Mm -hmm. And you also said that it's important um, that animals um, become the image of animal liberations uh, and not humans. Um, so, um, regarding that this topic is not very much present at a conference like this and also seldom, seldomly um, mentioned in the, um, in, the, uh, in the circles we are in, um, what do you think about uh, sanctuaries? Uh, which role do they play um, in um, direct actions and animal liberations and especially in um, um, bringing the, the individual animals um, uh, to light. Oh, wow. I, I love animal sanctuaries and I'd say that sanctuaries are one of the facets of our movement that every one of us should put some time into supporting. Um, I live in, in Seattle, Washington and nearby uh, in a town called Stanwood there's a sanctuary by the name of Pig's Peace. Um, one of the things that I like about Pig's Peace so much and I could, I could talk about them for hours. They're such a wonderful organization. Um, one of the things that they began to recognize, and I, I thought that it was such a wonderful confrontation of speciesism, was that animals that had been abused by humans for long periods of time um, would be traumatized by it and that they might not want to be around human beings. And so they have actually created space there um, on, on a large property where there are now groups of pigs who only hang out amongst each other and who walk out on that property. Um, people come around and they are checked on. It's made sure uh, from a distance that no one is injured. Uh, food is left for them and they have shelters. But I was really touched by the fact that essentially this was not uh, some kind of glorified petting zoo. This was a place where they could go to recover from the experiences that they had had at the hands of humans. And when people visit Pig's Peace and get a chance to see these animals living amongst each other and living the life that they would have sans human intervention, I think that many people are touched. It draws people to a, a conclusion about them and about their individuality and about the choices that they would make um, that, that is powerful. Um, Sanctuaries, of course, are going to be necessary. Right now, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of animals are confined. 
as a movement, as we began to damage these, these industries through legal actions, through protests, um, and through, yes, underground illegal direct actions, um, where are all of these animals going to go? Uh, you're correct that sanctuaries are, uh, in, at the end of the day, the answer. Um, of course, sanctuaries as legal organizations uh, cannot typically take on animals who have been removed from places of confinement. And so that's another interesting thing. We focus so much, again, on the human aspects of direct action. We focus on the people entering with the bolt cutters. We focus on the sledgehammers hitting the door. Um, we focus on that direct, on-the-ground moment. But what about the aftermath? Um, wouldn't it be almost an act of direct action or the ultimate act of direct action support if someone were to open up, uh, essentially, an underground sanctuary? It's an interesting thought. Are there, uh, are there other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you for your honesty and self-criticism. Thank you. Um, I appreciate very much you um, bring up the importance of putting in the front um, the face of the animals and not necessarily of humans. And what thoughts would you th have regarding for the part of the movement that is in this path of action to bring that face of the animal, but not the face in those suffering conditions, or not only that, but also bring maybe the animal as he or she is itself, if it would be in freedom. That's something that we usually forget of how is really the animal. I think that we have an advantage over the, uh, the first wave of animal liberators in the 1970s now because there's been this sort of democratization of media. Um, there was a time where putting together video um, was incredibly difficult and it required specialized skills and highly expensive equipment. Um, back in 1997, I produced a video series uh, called Breaking Free, and we did it on a Pentium 3 computer, and we had a nine gigabyte drive, and it cost us $3,000 for a nine gigabyte drive, and we were blown away. We we're like, holy fuck, nine gigs. <laughs> it's worth $3,000. And, and quite frankly, I could pull my phone out of my pocket right now and I think I could make a better video using, using this. It provides us with a kind of exciting opportunity, does it not? Uh, we are at a stage where animals who are rescued from places of abuse, not only can their rescue be publicized and used as an inspirational tool to hopefully provoke, provoke other people to take similar actions, um, but we can follow the lives of these animals afterwards. And there are distribution networks now online that would allow us to anonymously post this information and to basically show people, that's right, to basically show people the before and after uh, between abuse and liberation. I'm not sure how much time we have left. Is there, uh, are there more questions? Yeah, we still have 10 minutes. Ah, thank you. Are there other questions? Um, I was just wondering if you could um, come up with anything more specific, uh, specific ideas to do popular militancy. Hmm. I can. Um, uh, so I, I currently work on a on a project called uh, the Talon Conspiracy, and I, I guess really quick, I should explain the name because I, I keep getting questions about it. Uh, the Talon Conspiracy was a practical joke that me and several of my friends played on the FBI a few years ago, where we started this incredibly militaristic sounding organization called Talon, and, um, it, which is actually an acronym for Totally Awesome Liberation Organization. No way! <laughs> and um, when we incorporated this group, we, we actually did a legal incorporation of it. And in the United States, when you incorporate a nonprofit, you have to name officers and you have to give each of them a, a title. So we gave all the officers titles like guerrilla commander and, and things like that. 
And then we did nothing. We did nothing with the organization, but we just thought once these documents got filed by a former animal rights prisoner and my signature was on them, would the FBI begin to investigate it? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, yes, they will. Um, and so when we, had, when we had begun the website, and, and believe it or not, this is going to segue with your question eventually. Um, <laughs> When we had first uh, begun the website, um, there was a term that the Fur Commission uh, of the United States uh, used to use for traveling activists who would go around and disrupt their conferences and uh, break into fur farms. And that term, uh, and, and I apologize to those of you who are offended by it, but that term was conflict gypsy. Um, we had always uh, had that used against us, and so we uh, had decided when we first began the site that that's what we would call it. And the site, by the way, is an archive of, of old animal rights and environmental publications, videos, and films. Um, pardon me. Um, anyhow, uh, eventually several people had objected to the name, uh, saying that the term itself um, was a, a racial slur. Um, our organization is made up of volunteers, and every decision we make um, is, uh, is sort of a super majority sort of thing. It took a while to get enough votes, but eventually the, the name was changed to the Talon Conspiracy, mostly because, uh, frankly, we couldn't think of anything better. Um, however, on the site we have archived, dating back to 1945, hundreds of animal rights, uh, hundreds of animal rights publications. Um, going back through the history of this, and especially to the earliest days, um, there are so many examples of what I would call social direct action, of people participating in these things en masse. Um, of course, the Animal Liberation Leagues are the organization that is most famous for doing that. Um, but going back through the archives and beginning to read the stories about how they were doing these broad daylight raids, I think is a good place to start if we want to begin to envision what a more popular militancy for animal rights could look like. It doesn't say that that, uh, which is not to say that that could not happen um, without some tweaking. One of the issues that the Animal Liberation Leagues had was that because their leadership was not anonymous and because they organized publicly, um, they constantly faced this issue where they would be infiltrated, their plans would be found out, and towards the end of their run, people wanted to stop participating because the police basically already knew where they were going to go and what they were going to do and could show up. And what the police had realized was is that actually arresting the everyday people who arrived rather than uh, the organizers was their best course of action. Because what it did was it said to all these people who had maybe just shown up, who had maybe it was their first demo or their second demo, maybe they didn't have that commitment in their hearts yet, they would disappear and other people would see them disappear. And it became demoralizing. The leadership did get, uh, did get uh, attacked as well, but another thing that we see from old police documents now is that the police actually wanted the organizers to stay on the streets. If they were removed, then the police didn't know who might fill those shoes, and it might actually increase the chances um, for the social direct action to, to happen in the future. Of course, breaking into laboratories and fur farms and other places of animal abuse isn't really the only type of direct action available to us. Um, I like the forms of direct action that take people into places where they can directly see animals, where once again we can remove them from the realm of abstraction. However, we live in a capitalist society, and capitalism doesn't only take place at the point of extraction, which in this case would be like a slaughterhouse, um, or at a point of purchase, which in this case would be a store. Capitalism takes place everywhere that money is exchanged. And so animal abuse takes place at banks. It takes place at brokerages. Animal abuse takes place at market makers. And it takes place on Wall Street. It takes place uh, where stock is exchanged. 
So one form of popular direct action um, might actually become storming these places and stopping that flow of capital and thereby harming these industries, removing profit from them and creating sort of a, a negative incentive for them to continue what they're doing. Um, um, did that answer your question? Kind of. Kind of? <laughs> it was interesting. Do we have one other question? Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, just a like, quick question. Is um, repression keeping us away from being more popular as well? And how, how do we fight that nowadays? Because I think now um, we've got like CCTV everywhere and stuff like that. Maybe you didn't have so much back in the days. It's and, true. Um, and, um, um, so what do we do now? Do we get more, you know, power military? <laughs> <laughs> And how, well, not how do we fight repression, but how do we get more popular and isn't repression keeping us away from it? Repression is definitely an element that, that all movements have to deal with. Um, it's interesting though, because those of us in the animal rights movement often talk about repression as if we have dealt with the worst of it. Um, I think that Muslim communities right now, especially those living in the United States and in nations under the United States thumbs, would disagree with us very much. I think that the members of organizations like the ETA and the IRA, whose actions I don't necessarily always give support to, um, but those who basically had to endure torture for their actions, I, I think they would find what we have endured to um, not quite rise to the level of repression that they have seen. Somehow, through the repression that, that these communities have gone through, they have managed to stick together. Their center is held and they haven't fallen apart. Uh, they've managed to have sustainable actions that have continued on for a long period of time. I wish I had a, a very good answer for you, something that could concisely explain how to fight repression and how to keep it from ruining the popularity of direct action. Uh, I do not. But as I said earlier, the rhetoric and the aesthetic of direct action currently appeals mostly, in my mind, to angry young men uh, and, and not that softer part of our hearts that I mentioned earlier. I think that softer part of our hearts is more committed than an angry young man. I think that softer part of our hearts wants to liberate animals much more than, say, an 18-year-old in an earth crisis hoodie wants the approval of his peers, his or her peers, pardon me. Um, and so I believe that if we can begin to change the aesthetic and the rhetoric around direct action, we might actually be able to find a place where people would be more committed to it, more willing to take risks, and ultimately more willing to pay the price for those risks. Um, I know it's not a, uh, um, it's not a, a simple answer, but um, I, I suppose it's not exactly a simple problem either. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for enduring my speech today um, and coming out. Um, this has been a bit of a crazy weekend for me, and as I'm sure many of you in the audience know, uh, there have been some emails going around about me. Those of you who would like to investigate that and who'd be willing to talk to me about it, I'll be around afterwards, and I'd very much appreciate uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to talk to me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Josh Harper.